that's at 6 o'clock. All right, Genesis chapter 18. I'm going to read verses 1 through 15. And, uh, and then we'll look at these verses and study the word together. Genesis chapter 18 now, as we continue this series in the life of Abraham, we'll begin in verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he, said, or, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes, and behold, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, and bowed himself toward the ground, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts, after that ye shall pass on. Uh, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened to the tent unto Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran to the herd, and fetched a calf tender and good. And he gave it unto the young man, and uh, hastened to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I, shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee, and according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Lord, I pray that as we look at these words together, that uh, your Holy Spirit would guide us. And lead us, help us to understand what's before us now. And I pray that you would build our faith, uh, that we would uh, yield ourselves to you, uh, the Almighty God who is able to do anything. I pray that uh, you would confirm your words now to our hearts as we yield to the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this uh, passage is an exciting passage here. We've been building up to this, and of course, we're building and building and building. We'll get eventually uh, to chapter 21 when Isaac is born, and that's uh, kind of the real highlight, you know. We're all looking forward to that. Uh, we've seen as we've studied through Genesis here that God has given this promise to Abram, uh, and then he he kind of upgrades that promise and upgrades that promise and gives a little bit more and a little bit more. And we see the progressive revelation of his promise. Uh, and now we get to this chapter, chapter 18, where uh, he, he's already told uh, Abraham that it would be Sarah. Remember, he said, we're going to change Sarah's name uh, to reflect that. And so Sarah would be the one. And now in this chapter, we see that he lays out uh, the exact time when this promise was going to be fulfilled, which is really quite amazing. Uh, but he does it in a very uh, interesting way. Uh, interesting to, for us to observe the culture of the day here. And Abraham uh, is, uh, is uh, the, the, the Lord of his tent and all those that are with him. And, and he's sitting there in this hot tent in the heat of the day. And he's found a nice cool spot right in the door of the tent where some of that that, uh, that breeze perhaps would blow through, and, and Abraham is, is just sitting there. Uh, and then something happens, the Lord appears to him. You see that in verse 1, the Lord appeared unto him 
and the plains of Mamre. Now, we've seen this happen before, that the Lord appears to Abraham. And, and a fascinating thing that is, well, to imagine that God would appear to uh, any individual is, is surely remarkable. Can you imagine uh, what that would be like for you? That the Lord would appear to you. That the Lord would come to you. Now, we've come this morning, we've come to this uh, church, we've come to worship God, we've come to be with God, and, and we've taken steps of action to get ourselves here so that we can fellowship with God's people and we can corporately worship the Lord. But think of the thought that, that God went to Abraham. We, we think, okay, I'm going to God. I want to go to Him. I want to be in heaven. I want to, I want to make my way there. But, but the reality is, the great grace of God is pictured when God comes to you. And that's what's happening here. God came to Abraham. The Lord appeared to him. Uh, and He appears to him in an interesting way. It says here in the plains of Mamre, He sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Verse 2, He lift up His eyes and look, and lo, there were three men stood by Him. The Lord appears as a, as a human, and with Him are two others. As we'll see later on, these are evidently angels that appear with the Lord. And so uh, in, in the appearance of, of three men, they come and visit Abraham. He's sitting in the tent. He looks up and he sees, oh, who are these guys? Now, I don't know if he identified right there immediately who they were. I don't know if it took a little bit for him to figure this out. Um, but, but he seems to have an indication at least that these are respectable individuals because he runs to them and he bows before them. Uh, you see that at the end of verse 2. He bowed himself toward the ground. He, he runs to meet them. Uh, he bows himself towards the ground, showing great respect to them uh, because he knows these are honored guests. And indeed they are. Verse 3, and uh, he said, My Lord, now if I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. And he invites these guests in to fellowship uh, with him, to sit and have a meal together. Now I'm looking forward to the day when I'll be able to sit and have a meal with the Lord. That's going to be a good day. I think of uh, what Scripture describes as the Last Supper, when Jesus sat with his disciples in that upper room, and they had a very sweet and special time of fellowship. Before Jesus would be betrayed and then crucified, uh, he, he was pouring his heart out for his disciples, sharing with them incredible fellowship. What a wonderful time. In fact, he, he cries out to them. He, he says, that, boy, I, I long to enjoy Passover with you. Boy, I wish I could. And, and he just, he longs to have that wonderful fellowship. And he says, no, I will have it new with you in the kingdom. Uh, it's coming. It's going to happen. We're going to have a supper time in heaven. We ought to sing the song, Pastor Phil. Supper time in heaven. Uh, but we're going to have that supper time in heaven. I'm looking forward to that day, that wonderful time of fellowship when we're invited into his presence. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and it'll be a different setting than the throne room. Boy, that'll be a setting in and of itself when we see him and we bow ourselves before him and we uh, and we worship Him with all that we are. And we see pictures of that in, in the book of Revelation and in fact in, in uh, Isaiah as well. To see the throne room of God and that immediate response of worship where we bow ourselves before Him. But there's also coming an incredible time of fellowship with the Lord where we sit and eat with Him. Now we're looking forward to doing that just in a little bit. You say, that's right, Pastor Joel, so keep it moving. Uh, we're going to have that potluck downstairs where we get a little taste of heaven and we enjoy fellowship one with another. But we're going to enjoy that fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 14, Jesus kind of gives an indication of what, comes, uh, what goes into this kind of fellowship uh, that it seems that Abraham was enjoying. In John chapter 14, let me look quickly at this. Where again, at that last supper, Jesus is fellowshipping with his disciples. And he says in verse 21 of John chapter 14, 
uh, and, and he's beginning to pre- prepare them for his going away, his departure, his death. But in verse 21 of John 14, he says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Now that's an interesting thought. Uh, He says, obey my commands, love me. Now this isn't just do what I say and, and we'll do things together. But have a relationship with me, a love relationship with me, such that you naturally want to obey my commands. And so you obey my commands, you love me, I will love you, and I will make myself manifest to you. You think, wow, wouldn't that be neat to see the Lord? Abraham, in this case, the Lord appeared to him, was manifest to him. And so he got to meet the Lord. You think, wow, that would be so cool to meet the Lord. Well, Jesus shows us how. And having fellowship with him and having a love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, being obedient to his commands, which is, by the way, exactly what Abraham did. As we just studied in the previous chapter, Abraham uh, circumcised himself and his whole family. He was 99 years old and he circumcises himself and his son at 13 and everybody in the house. I mean, that's quite a step of obedience. And immediately following that step of obedience, the Lord comes to him in great fellowship. Wow. If you're feeling distant from God, could it be that you're missing out on that fellowship because you don't love Him as you ought to and you're not, you're not obeying His commands as you should? Live for Him. Love Him. And you watch as He manifests Himself to you. He'll come to you and say, well, I want to have some fellowship. In fact, in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus, uh, speaking to the churches, uh, talks about knocking at the door. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's he's, he's coming to you, and what, what is he longing for? Well, he longs to come in and sup with you. He longs to come in and fellowship with you and have an incredible time of fellowship with you. This this, uh, beautiful relationship that we see pictured here is not one of of Abraham cowering in fear before an almighty God, though that is true. But we see Abraham here, the friend of God, enjoying incredible fellowship with him. He said, boy, that's what I want. I want to have a friendship with God Almighty, and, and that's what Abraham enjoys right here. And so he invites them in back in Genesis chapter 18. And then we see this, uh, and, and as I was reading earlier, and as I was studying this, I was, I was thinking, boy, there's a lot of running around going here. <laughs> you know, Abraham uh, says there in um, verse 4, Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. So the, the, uh, the men are invited, and, and they're invited to, to come and sit, and he says, let me, let me go get some water. Oh, uh, maybe he orders it for somebody else, you know, a servant. Hey, hey, fetch some water. Uh, let's go. Let's get this water for these guys so they can relax a little bit. And, of course, in that culture, that would be a very, very relaxing thing to do. Wash your feet and just be comfortable. I know when I was flying to uh, India uh, and uh, we were taking this, this long 14-hour flight, uh, I thought it was interesting. They recommended that we take our shoes off. Take my shoes off. And I'm thinking, boy, I don't, I don't want this guy to take his shoes off. <laughs> you know? I mean, but, but you know, when I took my shoes off, I don't know what it was. I just was relaxed on that flight. 14 hours. Whew, it wasn't too bad, you know. Just taking my shoes off. Well, this is kind of, you know, this, this interesting in the culture of the day here. They're washing their feet, relaxing enjoying, being refreshed, being refreshed. And that's exactly uh, what he invites them to do. He says, uh, I will fetch a morsel of bread, verse 5. Comfort ye your hearts, that's be refreshed. Uh, And uh, he says, this is why you've come. And so he's doing all this. He he says, uh, I'll fetch a morsel of bread. Verse 6, he hastened into the tent and said um, to Sarah, 
ready, uh, quickly, make ready quickly three measures of, of fine meal. Hurry up and make the meal. And then verse 7, Abram ran to the, to the herd to fetch a calf and uh, tender. And, and so he prepares that meal. And then, the, and then he's whipping up some, uh, some nice stuff here, butter and milk in verse 8. Uh, and, and so he puts that together. And boy, a nice meal. But you see Abraham uh, just kind of rushing around to get everything done because he's serving the Lord. It's interesting. In, uh, in Romans chapter 12, we see something about hospitality. And Abraham here is, is showing great hospitality to, to these incredible and divine guests. He's showing great hospitality to strangers, by the way. He didn't know them. Um, but he shows them great hospitality. And I think this is perhaps one of the reasons why uh, we're given instructions in the New Testament to be hospitable to people to show hospitality, to show grace to others. Um, but I want to point your attention to something in Romans chapter 12, which I find is really fascinating. As the Apostle Paul is instructing the, the Christians in Rome, and you and I as well, to be hospitable, he says this in verse 13 of chapter 12. Distribu distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Now the word given here is often translated pursuing or, or running to. And that's interesting. I, as I was studying this, I was thinking, boy, that's exactly what Abraham's doing. I mean, he's running to be hospitable. He's running here, he's running there, he's going all over the place. He is given to hospitality because what he wants to do is make sure that his guests, his divine guests, are comfortable, are refreshed, and so he's going to put in the effort, the work, so that they don't have to, is kind of the idea. Now imagine our relationship with God, with the Lord. He doesn't need us to do anything. But are we eager to kind of rush to refresh him? Are we eager to, to kind of rush around and do what he wants to be pleasing to him? Again, he doesn't need anything from us, but he enjoys fellowship with us. Are we, are we in kind of a relationship with God where we expect God to do things for us? Or are we in a relationship with God where we have such a love for him that we are rushing to do things for him. It's an interesting thought. You know, oftentimes we, we kind of picture God as just, you know, the big guy in the sky that's going to take care of me when I'm in a fix, when I'm in a mess and I need him. I think he longs for something deeper than that, don't you? And we can give him something more than that. Where we our, fulfill our purpose by honoring Him Amen. and glorifying Him. That's what we're here for. The Bible says in Revelation that all things uh, were created for His pleasure. You and I were created for His pleasure, for His refreshment. Let us rush to refresh Him and to, uh, uh, and to, to glorify Him. I must hasten on because our time is flying. Back in Genesis chapter 18, we've seen Abraham rushing around. We've read the text earlier. Abraham uh, rushing around and, and making this, this meal and being very hospitable uh, for his divine guests. In verse 9, though, we get to the, the real purpose of the visit. Why had God come to visit Abraham? It almost seems to me that his purpose in coming to Abraham was not so much for Abraham, but for Sarah. In verse 9, he says, they said unto him, where's Sarah thy wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. Now, we would think of the culture of the day and, and imagine that uh, the women are just to be in the background or whatever. 
That's not the case from God's perspective. You know, he's not there just to meet up with Abraham, the important guy. He's there to meet up with Sarah and have a divine encounter with her. Because God was going to use Sarah in an incredible way. And in fact, we see in the book of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul, I think, uh, writing Hebrews, talks about Sarah's faith and that she was strengthened in faith. I think she was strengthened in faith because she had been weak in faith. And we see it in this passage. She was weak in faith. They're looking for Sarah. Where's Sarah, thy wife? He says, well, she's back here in the tent. Now, he doesn't necessarily invite her out of the tent. But it seems evident that he knows she can hear. And so maybe even he raises his voice a little bit just so she can hear. I don't know if that's the case. But in verse 10, he says, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. Uh, That phrase, time of life, there's a couple of different thoughts on that. Either the time of reviving when, when, uh, when life is renewed or... Uh, when again this time comes around next year, seems to be more likely that. Um, But at a certain time, uh, he would return. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now, verse 11, I think, is a really important verse. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old and well-stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. And what we know from Romans chapter 4 is that it was also beyond Abraham's time to father a child. It was impossible for both of them, from our understanding, to have any children. Remember, Abraham at this stage is 99, okay? Uh, and, and when he would father the child, he'd be 100, and Sarah would be 90. So it's, it's just a little too late in our thinking for any kind of family here, but not so with God. Abraham and Sarah were old and well-stricken in age. You say, boy, Pastor Joel, that's what I feel like, well-stricken. <laughs> Ouch, you know, oh man, I'm well-stricken. There's hope. (laughs) Okay, there's hope for us. Oh, my. You know, God is able. We have this tendency to think that things will not happen unless we are able, but that is totally upside down. Things happen because God is able. And in fact... He can do more when I acknowledge that I am unable. Which perhaps is the very reason why God delays the fulfillment of this promise until it was very clear to everyone that it was too late for Abraham and Sarah. It was too late. It was impossible. (laughs) And that's when God steps in. God gave this promise. You know, I almost wonder if they were just beyond the hope of this at this point in their lives, just thinking, well, you know, I know what God said, but let's not get our hopes up, (laughs) you know. God gives a promise. He's going to do it. He's going to fulfill his promise no matter our inabilities. And that's his point here. They're well stricken in age. And even Sarah, verse 12, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I'm waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Now, Sarah has the liberty to call her husband old here. (laughs) This guy's old. She calls herself old as well. She laughs within herself. She doesn't laugh out loud, it would seem, just quietly in her own heart. This laugh seems to be a different kind of laugh than what we've, what we've seen with Abraham. Remember, Isaac would be called Isaac because of Abraham's laughter. But also, I think, it also points to Sarah's laughter as well. 
they both laugh at the thought. Abraham, as we saw in the last chapter, laughs in wonder and amazement. (laughs) Wow, can this be? Oh, praise God. Sarah laughs in doubt. (laughs) Are you kidding me? (laughs) That's not going to happen. It is amazing. It's beyond our comprehension to imagine that something like this could happen. And even Sarah herself. I mean, just think about it. What she says here. After I am waxen old, shall I have pleasure? And that's an interesting thought. A different, uh, there, there are different ways to think about that phrase, shall I have pleasure? Shall I have pleasure to be a mother? Or shall I enjoy the pleasures of a marriage relationship that I enjoyed when I was a lot younger? You know, as, as time goes on, uh, and, and our bodies fail, uh, our pleasure in marriage changes as well. And perhaps Sarah's thinking, <laughs> I'm not going to enjoy that. I'm not going to enjoy being a mother. It's just, it's, it's, I'm too old for that. But God is the God of the impossible. And he says here uh, in verse number 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? Uh, This after he questions Abraham. Let's look at that in verse 13. The Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? He says, What? Did Sarah laugh? Why did she laugh? And of course, nobody else knew that she laughed, except for the Lord, who knew her heart, because she laughed within herself. And Abraham's thinking, well, I didn't hear her laugh. But maybe Abraham's thinking to himself, yeah, well, I laughed too when I, when I heard that, <laughs> you know. Why did she laugh? And then this mountain of a verse. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Boy, put that verse on your wall. Memorize that one. Take some time and meditate on that. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And, uh, and, and think about what anything could mean. <laughs> Just meditate on that. And when you feel the lowest, when you feel lost and without hope, and when you feel like there is no point in going on, think of this verse. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I mean, really, the God who spoke the world into existence, the God who said, let there be light, and boom, there was light. The God who has creative ability, who has power beyond any power that you've ever seen before, is anything too hard for the Lord? And we limit God somehow to what we can see as possible. Well, okay, God, maybe you can do it this way, or maybe you can do it that way. No, you fool. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No, certainly not. And what he does is beyond your imagination. Beyond what you can come up with. And all of your plans and purposes that you devise in your own brain are so limited and so small in the light of the creative God of the universe. Is anything too hard for the Lord? If God can heal and revive Sarah's dead womb and and Abraham's inability to father a child, then God can certainly remedy your situation and give you hope and the healing that you need. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Reminds me of of the words of the angel when when the angel Gabriel met with Mary and Mary said, wait a minute, I mean, you're saying I'm going to have a baby, but I I know how this works. (laughs) And I don't think that's going to happen. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. No, it's not. We limit God in our views, and so we limit our capacity for worship as well. We don't worship Him as He ought to be worshipped because we don't see Him as incredible and all-powerful as He really is. And if we would just expand our view of God 
And meditate on that verse as anything too hard for God. Then we would immediately worship Him. That's the only response. We would worship Him. I think Sarah recognizes her lack of faith here. And she shows some shame. Because... After the Lord says, is anything too hard for the Lord? In the time appointed, I will return to thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I, I, I laugh not. I, I don't know if, if she was trying to lie or if she was just saying, I shouldn't have done that. In either case, she knows uh, there's some shame in her laughter because she realizes this is the God of the impossible. I'm doubting God. In, uh, in Hebrews 11, the Bible talks about Sarah, and you can study this as our time is gone, I know, but you can study this later that Sarah conceived by faith. I'm not trying to be inappropriate, but just to think it would have taken faith to get into bed. Right? It's amazing. By faith. I think the angels came to strengthen her faith to make this impossible situation a reality. It's incredible. It's incredible. She recognized her lack of faith, but we know from the book of Hebrews that her faith was strengthened, and now she is lifted up for us as a great example of faith. Faith. Do you believe God? Do you believe Him? Do you believe that He can do anything that He says He can do? It is a miracle that you can be right with God today. It is a miracle that your sins can be forgiven. It is a miracle that you can have a fellowship with him, that he can sup with you, that you can enjoy fellowship with the incredible holy God of the universe. It is a miracle, and it doesn't happen by your ability. It happens, in fact, when you finally realize you are unable you are unable to know God. You are unable to be righteous enough. You are unable to do what He expects. You are unable to live for Him. You can't do it. And when you finally understand that and accept that, and then when your vision of God is so big that you realize He can do what I can't do, then you you repent from your sin and you turn to faith in Him and say, God, I need you. Because I can't. I can't. That's how anybody gets saved. And that's how anybody grows in their faith. And that's how anybody is made righteous in the eyes of God. It's by faith. It's by faith. And what a great example for us here in Scripture. Well, let's bow our heads together and we'll pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for showing us what faith is in the example of both Abraham and Sarah. And I thank you that even though Sarah was weak in the faith, you by your grace sent your angels to strengthen her faith. And Lord, we approach you this morning as that man who was longing to be healed by Jesus. When Jesus asked him if he believed, he said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. God, we are asking you to help our unbelief. Lord, display your power for us. Point us to your incredible ability. Lord, may we meditate on that thought that there's nothing too hard for you. And may we find that incredible power in you to accomplish for us what we could never do for ourselves. Lord, for that person that's here this morning, still struggling with 
salvation, struggling with a relationship with you, struggling and wondering if it's even worth it. God, please work in that heart. and Bring them to faith in Jesus Christ as they recognize that they are unable, but you in your love and power are able. And Lord, for that Christian this morning who's struggling with doubts and wondering if it's worth it all, Lord, help them to meditate on that thought. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Lord, give them the courage and the faith to believe your promises and trust in you no matter what. Lord, do a work in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.